Module 5 will discuss the process for designing pavement for widenings. This module applies to projects that include things like trench widenings, which are relatively narrow widenings that are less than a lane width, lane additions, such as turn lanes or median openings, and operational type projects, which could be intersection improvements. In general, widening designs don't typically require thickness calculations, but you'll still need to check your structural number. You need to determine what the existing pavement structure consists of. The widening section should be designed to match the existing pavement structure plus any overlay pavement. The total structural number of the widened section must equal or exceed the total existing mainline structural number. Also, there may be some projects where the existing pavement structure is something you don't particularly need or want to match. An example would be a case where the existing pavement is 12 inches thick due to numerous overlays, but the adjacent widening does not need to be that thick. You'll want to take special care to avoid designing pavement alignments, which result in a widening longitudinal joint in the wheel path. Research has shown that these joints in the wheel path will inevitably lead to a higher rate of joint deterioration. If possible, the joint line should be shifted further into the existing pavement to reduce or eliminate this condition. Now let's look at some details. For the structural course, your proposed thickness will need to be at least as thick as the existing structural layer. This will allow for future milling and resurfacing projects. If you place a much thinner pavement structure adjacent to a thicker existing one, when you come back and mill it in 20 years, you'll run the risk of milling into the base material of the thinner pavement structure. However, there are times where this may be impractical to match the existing pavement. As we just discussed on the previous slide, there are some older roads that have had numerous overlays, and so the best thing you can do is use good judgment where you have extremely thick existing pavements. It's important that you, as the pavement design engineer, evaluate what will be left if there's a future milling operation that for some reason removes a substantial amount of asphalt. In general, a 4-5 to five inch thickness of structural asphalt is a reasonable limit depending on truck volumes for inside traffic lanes which has less truck use. Also, you need to consider the constructability of your pavement widening design. Just like we do for new construction projects, you'll want to sketch a typical section of your proposed design to make sure it's reasonably constructible. Widening projects need to be kept as simple as possible. If a granular base is going to be used, it should be designed to be flush with the existing base material. Asphalt structural layers will then be brought up to the top of the existing asphalt layers. Subsequent asphalt layers can then be constructed full width over the existing roadway and the widening. The purpose is to minimize the possibility of a longitudinal crack at the joint. For complicated projects, your district construction office can help with constructability related decisions, so be sure to coordinate with your district construction engineer. The strength of the widened section base material needs to match or exceed the existing base strength. If we remember from previous modules, the strength is calculated by multiplying the thickness of the base times its layer coefficient. You will need to visualize what's left when future milling occurs to ensure that the remaining structural numbers are compatible. Normally, the top of the new base and the top of the old base should match to facilitate future milling. From the top of the existing base down, the widening structural number must be equal to or greater than the existing structural number, including any stabilized subgrade. On any type of widening project, the base options to be used may be specified by the payment design engineer and shown in the plans. This will ensure layer coefficients that are equal or greater than the existing base. On selected projects, it may be necessary to justify and use an asphalt base, type B 12.5 or black base, for widening. However, with proper design, it may be possible to take advantage of the potential economics of a granular base material and bid an optional base. Stabilization should be considered when adding lanes or shoulders and on some operational type projects. The use of stabilization in trench widening strips is generally not recommended. When stabilization is eliminated, the reasons should be documented in the project file. When stabilization is not provided, single course base layers should not be used. For widening projects, such as the addition of a new lane with substantial fill heights in excess of 3 feet, soil samples should be obtained from potential borrow areas. The lab resilient modulus should be obtained for the new embankment to evaluate if additional pavement structure is needed for the widening. So let's look at an example problem. Let's say we have an existing two-lane, two-way road, traffic level C, design speed of 65 miles an hour, with 11-foot travel lanes and unpaved shoulders. 
The proposed resurfacing of this road is to mill two and a half inches and resurface with one and a half inches of super pave and one and a half inches of FC 12.5 with PG 76 minus 22. The existing grass shoulders are stabilized but not paved. For our project, we want to widen our travel lanes and also add some paved shoulders, so we need to do a widening design. For this particular road, we're going to add one foot to the existing travel lanes and also pave five feet of the existing stabilized shoulder. So to do our widening design, we need to know a little bit about our existing pavement structure. The pavement coring report shows that there is around three and a half inches of structural and friction course that's in poor condition underlain by 10 inches of good lime rock and 12 inches of good stabilization. Remember, for widenings, we need to be sure that the strength of our widened section base material matches or exceeds our existing base strength. So we can use the information from our pavement cores to calculate our existing base strength. If we remember our optional base group table from the previous module, we can find out what our existing base strength is. We know that we have 10 inches of lime rock base. So we look at the lime rock LBR100 column here, and go down to where we see a 10 inch layer thickness. Here we see it's in base group 9 which yields a structural value of 1.8 and so that's the value our new base material needs to meet. So since we are only widening 6 feet total on either side of the road we know that it's a pretty tight spot to fit some construction equipment into and so for this particular project we're going to call for using black base for constructability purposes. So going back to our optional base group table Let's see what thickness of B12.5 will give us a structural value of 1.8. Remember, we need to look at base group 9 for the structural value of 1.8. So looking across at group 9 and finding the column with type B12.5, we see that we need to design with 6 inches of type B12.5 for our widening. So now that we know our base material and thickness that we need to use, let's look at our asphalt layers. Remember that the milling recommendation for this project is to mill two and a half inches and place back three inches of asphalt. Our widening design needs to match the pavement layers that we're placing on the existing roadway. So for our widening, we will simply match the mainline resurfacing design and use one and a half inches of type SP and one and a half inches of FC 12.5 with PG 7622. So in case you're wondering about whether or not the paved shoulder should have a different pavement design, the answer is usually yes. However, in this particular situation of only widening the travel lane by one foot, we decided to go ahead and use the same pavement design for the adjacent paved shoulder as well. This makes the construction of the total widening much simpler. This way the new base can be constructed as a single effort and the paving of the 12 foot travel lane and the 5 foot shoulder can all be done at the same time. This is probably easiest seen in a widening detail sketch. So let's pretend for a second that the shoulder was designed differently from the travel lane. It would look something like this. Chapter 5 of the Flexible Manual provides some minimum base groups and thicknesses, so our shoulder could use one inch of structural asphalt and optional base group one. So this is how it would look, and with the sketch, we can quickly see the constructability issue here. It would be extremely difficult to construct a one foot wide section of black base here. So instead, we can design it simply with one payment design as shown in this sketch. Now we see the base can be constructed all in one effort, and the travel lane and the shoulder can be paved all together. In this instance, the ease of construction outweighs any concern of over-designing the shoulder. This concludes Module 5, Pavement Design Process for Widening.